Almost every great fighter has that one opponent that always gives them fits. Gene Tunney had Harry Greb. Sugar Ray Robinson had Jake LaMotta. Muhammad Ali had Ken Norton. And Mando Ramos had himself. Substance abuse issues would bring him down before any opponent would. He was the fighter once described as the Elvis of boxing, able to bring in both male and female fans and becoming the biggest sports draw in a phenomenon writers called Mondo Ramos was born November 15, 1948 in Long Beach, California to Raymond and Maggie Ramos. His father was a World War II veteran and an alcoholic who was frustrated at his own inability to forge a boxing career. Employed as an iron worker, he transferred his desire for boxing onto his sons, Manuel, Mondo, and Andrew. Sometimes he would take the young boys to bars and have them put on shadow boxing exhibitions for nickels and dimes. Mando's mother, Maggie, described her time with Raymond as, quote, a very hard life, which led to her own alcoholism. The couple would divorce in 1951, and the boys would live with their father despite a court order which gave his mother custody. Growing up in the projects of Long Beach, Mondo was quiet and shy. By the age of 11, he had started drinking because of, quote, all that pain inside. I had an emotional cancer. The high he had experienced in getting drunk for the first time got a hold of him. I remember praying to God, Mando said, to help me feel like that forever. Despite being the victim of generational alcoholism, Mondo wasn't lazy. Working three or four paper routes at the same time, but using the money to buy booze. His life became a cycle of working, getting drunk, coming home, and getting slapped around by his father. His older brother Manuel was the first to enter boxing as a competitor, winning two Golden Gloves titles. Mando himself wandered into the gym where Manuel trained. He told Manuel's trainer, Jackie McCoy, that he could beat his brother, who was five years older. I always told Jackie that I would win the championship before I was able to vote, Mando said, and I did it. At the age of 16, Mando would begin training seriously for the Golden Gloves and would win the tournament. He would turn professional three days after his 17th birthday under the guidance of Los Angeles managers McCoy and Lee Perla. The state commissioners looked the other way from his underage status because he was so good. All of my life I tried to please people, Mondo said. I never had a mind of my own. When I was little, I always worked so I could give the money to my dad to drink just to get a pat on the head. Then I went into boxing to please people. They told me when to train, what to eat, and when to get up. Mondo was an immediate hit at the Los Angeles Olympic Auditorium. His style was flashy and photogenic, quickly attracting sellout crowds which chanted the name Mondo during his ring entrance. One reporter described him as, quote, a wide-eyed assassin on spindly legs. He could rip off combinations like a machine gun, slip punches like a fencing master, render an opponent senseless with either hand, and then dance the rest of the night away. By the age of 18, he boasted about being the highest paid teenager in the world. Life was easy, Ramos said. I had talent, so I was knocking over those guys and getting 10 grand to fight. I thought it would go on forever. See, when you're 20, 21, time doesn't pass by. Later, it's over in a hurry. A sensational 10 round victory for young Mondo Ramos making his 11th start as a professional, his third start as a main eventer. And the 8,500 people in attendance here at the Olympic Auditorium this evening meet with, uh, agree with the officials, I should say, on the outcome of the fight. Mondo, that was quite an evening. Oh, that was a really tough fight, really. His style had me really confused, his softball style. I couldn't do what I wanted to, but. In the, early start, in the early stages of the fight, you were trying to nail him with a left hook, but you had a little trouble there. What did Jackie tell you to do in the corner? Go to his body. He said, hit that body. and Well, I knew it was slowing him up with body shots, you know. Because every time I came back, Jackie says, go to that body, keep going to that body. What did you find, although you were able to reach him with both left hooks and straight right hands, what did you find the easiest to punch to hit him with, uh, Mondo? Well, Jackie kept telling me a left, right uppercut to the body. And and that, that was really a sizzler. Jackie, we step over here, if you will, please. You tell him to throw that right hand right up the middle, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. 
That one's fine. And that's Mark, too, believe me. Did I say that? I sound like somebody <laughs> else. You sound like a, a frog the poop. Mondo, how do you feel after the 10 rounds? Right. As the old man pointed out here, that did you more good than all the knockouts, the first and second right. round knockouts that could possibly happen to you. It was really good for me. Really and good. now, by golly, you know how to fight a southpaw. Mickey? Uh, stick, st make so get over here so the, so the camera can get a good shot of you. Let me make an excuse for him, although he don't need an excuse. He fought a real good fight against a tough, cagey veteran, but uh, he did have a lot of trouble making a weight, and that's the last time you'll see Mondo in at anything under 130, Jack, preferably I was, about 132. I was going to ask you about that, Jackie. In his very next start, you hope to start him in the in your junior lightweight class. Right, is that correct? That's right. Thanks so much, Jackie. Mondo, again, congratulations on a fine fight. Thank you. At the age of 19, he would marry a dancer named Stella Seha, and the Los Angeles press described it as a fairy tale romance, the beauty and the boxer. But his father opposed the marriage which further alienated him from his son. Then the couple would divorce shortly after their own son was born. Still, his boxing career was on the fast track. Ramos would win 17 straight fights, becoming one of the biggest stars at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. In July of 1967, Ramos would substitute for his stablemate Raul Rojas, who had to pull out in a bout against Kang il Sa of South Korea. Kang was rugged, fast, and experienced, and Ramos's manager McCoy second guessed himself immediately after agreeing to the bout. Effective to the body. In the eyes of more than 10 newspaper men covering this fight, it's dead even. Half of them for Ramos, half of them for Su Kang Il. They all have the fight advantage by just one point. It's that close. Su Kang Il landing with the right hand. Although the hometown favorite, a slight underdog to the more experienced So Kang Il. And Il gets off with a good combination. getting the better of the exchange and he continues to fire and score now listen to the cheer now at the final bell and how deserved it is the referee George Lapkus sees it five to four like Judge Thomas, unanimously the winner, Sue Kai Ramos's training regimen was non-existent after the loss. Three months later, he would be given a beating by the trial horse and best friend, Frankie Crawford. Ramos resumed strict training after the two losses, and four months later, he would decision Crawford in a rematch. But his training and performances would continue to be erratic. He would be the underdog against Hiroshi Kobayashi, but rise from the floor and win an impressive decision. Three months later, he would get a shot at the lightweight crown against Teo Cruz, but he would spend the majority of his training camp partying with stablemate Raul Rojas. Ramos would rally in the last five rounds, but it would be too little too late, as he would lose a close and controversial decision. Rojas would eventually succumb to his own addictions, turning to panhandling, and later, wasting away in a convalescent home. Later, Mondo's arguments with his father grew more violent. A rematch was signed with Cruz five months later, and nothing could be left to chance. Mondo would bar his father from the gym and all of his activities right before meeting Cruz for the second time. Meanwhile, Ramos's managers, Jackie McCoy and Lee Perla, took turns locking Mondo in a Santa Monica motel for weeks before the fight, performing bed checks, making sure that he was contained before his title challenge.
stinging left jab to Mike Cross. Now once again, now once again, referee John Thomas has called for the doctor. This might be it. We'll wait for the decision. And that's it. A TKO of 19 seconds of the 11th round. And Mondo Ramos is the new lightweight champion of the world, the youngest ever in the history of boxing. Mondo was now world champion, but his father could not bask in the glory. It was the lowest point of my life to be kept away at that moment, Raymond said. I cried afterward. The father and son would eventually reconcile, but once Mondo won the title, trouble seemed to increase in his life. The newly crowned lightweight champion would be arrested for drunk driving and marijuana possession. All of my life, I'd been quiet and shy, Ramos said. When I was champion, I didn't like it at all. Oh, I liked the money and the women, but I only had confidence when I was drinking. See, I never liked to talk to people because of my fears and lack of education. They wanted me to go on the Ed Sullivan show, and I said, no way. When they asked me to speak to kids at school, I'd go into a total panic. Now the youngest lightweight champion in history, Mando's drug and alcohol use increased. He would elude the watchful eye of McCoy and Perla and head to either the Golden Q Billiard Parlor or to his mother's family restaurant called Old Mexico. Friends wanting to party would meet him at either venue. Now a world champion, everybody loved him, and he loved everybody back, especially the women. A hot commodity, Ramos's managers received offers of over $100,000 for his contract, but his managers never came close to selling his contract, believing that Ramos was worth substantially more, if he kept his head on straight. The boxer was also offered a role in a movie in which he would be paid $2,000 a week for 10 weeks. Mondo could have a lot of fun for 10 weeks, McCoy said, and make a lot of money for practically doing nothing or whatever they do in movies or TV. But what happens after that? Is the boy going to live on that money for the rest of his life? McCoy steered Ramos clear of Hollywood, trying to keep him busy in the ring. In March of 1970, Ramos would defend his title against the crafty Ismael Laguna at the sports arena in Los Angeles. Laguna had a reputation as being one of boxing's best cutters, a slashing puncher who left his opponents bloodied and cut to ribbons.
The press reported that Laguna cut Ramos up so bad that they didn't know whether to call a doctor or a tailor. Ramos wanted an immediate rematch. I really didn't realize what it meant, Ramos said after the loss. Laguna's manager said once that you really don't appreciate the title until you've lost it. That's the one thing I've learned. Five months later, Mando's comeback began against former featherweight champion Sugar Ramos, a Cuban-born refugee who fought out of Mexico. Matchmaker Don Chargan would call it, quote, the greatest fight I ever saw, and I think any of the 10,000 people who saw it live would agree. Both boys, a lot of experience, a lot of great talent. You don't become champion of the world, and they both have been. A good right hand by Mondo. Two good left hooks by Mondo. And the left eye of Sugar Ramos is really getting puffed now. Left and right by Mondo. Sugar tries to chase him. Well, Tom Mondo said before the fight, stick and move and punch. Jerry's hurt. Sugar's hurt. Thank you.
summoned all of his strength in the last round to salvage a victory, his career and life seemingly now back on track. In November of 1971, Ramos would face ex-sailor Pedro Carrasco of Spain for the vacant lightweight title after Ken Buchanan had been stripped of the belt. Ramos would enjoy his time in Spain, remarking that he would like to come back one day and buy a home on the coast. He was treated like a celebrity by the Spaniards, given a respect he wasn't given at home but in the ring, he would be robbed. Carrasco would win by disqualification after Ramos had floored him four times, but the inexperienced referee raised Carrasco's hand for what he described as, quote, illegal punches that went below the belt. Ramos was in tears after the bout, calling it the greatest robbery in boxing history. Three months later, the two would face each other again, and this go around, Ramos would win a controversial decision. Four months later, Ramos would return to Madrid for the rubber match. Once again, the result would be controversial. Ramos would floor Carrasco twice, but the Spaniard would outwork him over the next several rounds. Ramos would win the final two stanzas and secure a split decision, which was booed by the pro-Carrasco crowd. Seven months later, however, Ramos would look like a completely different fighter when he stepped in to defend his belt against Chango Carmona. Carmona was a 60-fight veteran who had knuckle marks all over his face and wasn't expected to give Ramos a challenge. Still, Ramos' managers had him train in an area so secluded that one reporter called it, quote, an area code reserved for desert rats, tumbleweeds, and rattlesnakes. I've changed, Ramos said. I realized I've let my fans down. I've let my son down. I'm going to get in real good shape this time. But the cynical reporters found his promises shallow, as Ramos had spoken of reform in many of his previous bouts and rarely achieved it. My goal right now is to hold three titles, Ramos said. The lightweight, junior welterweight, and welterweight. I'll fight Peppermint Frazier, then Napoli's. The lofty goals aside, somehow Ramos escaped from the dreary confines of his training camp and got a hold of drugs and booze. The lightly regarded Carmona would punish him for his transgressions. Thank you. 
The defeat to Carmona finished Ramos as a fighter. A proud warrior, he could never get past the stigma of having to be carried out of the ring on a stretcher. Mando would be hospitalized for a concussion and lost his will to compete in the sport. I'd been fighting all those years to get my father's praise, Ramos said, and I never felt that from him. I just couldn't seem to please him. I didn't see any reason to keep on fighting. He would return to the ring almost a year later and would be knocked out by Arturo Pineda in five rounds. He then took off another nine months before going on a multi-fight tour of Europe, thinking that a change in geography might make a difference. It wouldn't. Ramos would wind up broke and return to the States. I wasn't training, Ramos said. All I was doing was using drugs. Mondo then blew a chance to appear in a car dealership commercial when he had an alcoholic seizure during filming. He then found work as a longshoreman, but the drinking soon made him unemployable. The former 135-pounder now ballooned up to 200 pounds. By his late 20s, Ramos began using heroin. He would sleep on a cot in a Long Beach gym or his car, and panhandle for change rather than pawn his championship belt. He was coaxed out of retirement at the age of 27 and had four fights in a four-month period, which ended with him overdosing on heroin before a fight in Las Vegas in which he was knocked unconscious in two rounds. He would reach rock bottom when he discovered his brother Manuel unconscious on his couch. Mondo would call the paramedics, but his brother would be dead in his arms by the time help arrived. Shortly thereafter, his best friend Frankie Crawford was hospitalized after being shot in the back. Ramos' former girlfriend Sylvia would reach out to him and drive him to be at Crawford's bedside. Crawford would become paralyzed and take his own life seven years later. Meanwhile, Sylvia would take Ramos home and nurse him back to health. In 1979, he would be hospitalized for alcoholic seizures, but remain dry for two years. He would marry Sylvia, but the union came close to ending several times until he was arrested for drunk driving while visiting his son. The proximity of his arrest to his son shamed him, and Ramos finally admitted that all of his life's problems were connected to his drinking. He would seek help from the Longshoremen's Union who sent him to drug rehab. It was 1983, and Mondo started to rebuild his life. After leaving the clinic, he would resume work as a longshoreman. He would then give back to the community, starting an organization called BAD, Boxers Against Alcohol and Drugs. They used to ask me to go to school and talk, but I could never do it, Ramos said. Like telling them don't drink this and don't smoke that when I was doing it all myself. Ironically, by lecturing inner city kids about the dangers of drugs, and teaching him the sport of boxing would help him remain sober for the next 25 years. In June of 2008, Ramos would be inducted into the California Boxing Hall of Fame. Two weeks later, he would die of respiratory arrest at his home in San Pedro, California. He was 59 years old. A lot of fighters can't accept reality, Ramos said. We were on top and we think it's going to last forever. Then we lose it and we go down the tubes and we can't pull ourselves out. So we drink and do drugs to escape reality. Memories are nice. I had some good times. But Jackie McCoy always told me that you can't look back. He says you got to be happy with what you have right now. Today. <laughs> <laughs> 